as you practice, you have to have a good sense of an inner teacher, someone who's watching over what you're doing and correcting you when you're going off course. This is one of the functions of mindfulness, to remind you of what the course is. This is why the Buddha compares mindfulness to a goad. You may remember a goad is a, <clears throat> a goad is a long stick with a pointed end. In the old days, farmers would have the water buffalo pulling the plow, and the water buffalo started going off course. You take the stick and you poke it to get it back on, on course. If it was turning to the right, you'd poke it on the right. If it's turning to the left, you poke it on the left to keep it from going away from the road that you're trying to plow. So you need this kind of mindfulness to look after you, because after all, no one else is looking into your mind right now. And even people who can read minds, they can't be reading your mind all the time. You've got to be reading your own mind. When the story starts getting a little strange, you have to bring in other characters to straighten it back out. And this inner teacher is a really good one to have. So what kind of questions does the inner teacher ask? What kind of comments does the inner teacher make? One of the questions is that one that's in the ten things that every one who has gone forth should think about. And it applies to all of us here. Because as John Sawat commented, the eight precepts count as going forth. And the question is, when am I becoming as days and nights fly past, fly past? How are you changing? How are you developing? Are you staying stuck in your old ways, or are you moving in a good new direction? And look at the kind of person you're becoming in your thoughts and your words and your deeds. To see if that's the kind of person you continue wanting to be. As the Buddha said, if you want to make progress in the path, you can't stay content with your skillful qualities much less with your unskillful ones. Well, often we defend our unskillful qualities by saying, well, that's just the way I am. And trying to think of that verb, I am, as more, that's the way I've become. The implication being that you don't have to stay that way. Things can change. You can make things change. So think in terms of becoming rather than just being. There's a process going on here, and you don't want to be the process of just solidifying and growing stagnant. You want to ask yourself, what are the ways in which I can improve? How would I like to be able to answer that question tomorrow, and then the next day, and then the next day? So there's a better answer every day. In some cases, the better answer will come with the fact that your meditation is going better. In other, in other cases, it has to do more with the way we're interacting with one another here. Because that's part of the practice, too. You'll notice that in those eight factors of the path, there's right speech, there's right action. And the Buddha's list of qualities to go to me about what counts as dharma and what doesn't count as dharma. Some of them have to do with the goal at which you're aiming. In other words, we're aiming at being unfettered, we're aiming at dispassion. Some of them have to do with qualities that you develop within yourself, like ar arousing your persistence. But others have to do with how you interact with other people, so that you're not a burden on them. You can actually be a good friend to them, in other words, being a good example in the practice and encouraging them in their practice, too. At the very least, not getting in the way. Remember, we don't have a vow of silence here at the monastery. But it's good to think that when you're breaking silence, there has to be a reason for it. Because you want to hope that other people are working on their minds. And you don't want to disturb that. You disturb it only when it's really necessary. And keep your speech in line with right speech. Keep your actions in line with right actions. That's for your internal effort. That's right effort. It 
it's interesting that when the Buddha lists the, the four customs of the Noble Ones, the one custom that really directly relates to the Eightfold Path is the very last one, to delight in abandoning and to delight in developing. And that relates directly to right effort. He's pointing right effort out as a custom of the Noble Ones. So this means that you look at your mind, and whatever you see that's unskillful, that's already there, you try to abandon it, and then you try to make sure it doesn't come back. Which means that when you're meditating, it's not just a matter of being here in the present moment. Sometimes at the end of the meditation you want to think about difficult situations that may come up in the course of the day, cases in which you've been behaving in an unskillful way in the past. How can you avoid behaving that same way over and over again? Give some thought to that. As for skillful qualities, if you look around you don't see many inside, you have to regard yourself as poor. But that doesn't mean they're not there, it's just the potentials haven't been developed. So you look for the potentials and you nurture them. As the Buddha said, there is the potential for calm, both in the body and in the mind. Look for it. Where is a calm spot in the body? If you don't sense it immediately, just think of the fact we've got bones. Bones are pretty calm. They don't get upset, upset or excited about things. Just think about your bones and make your mind like earth, as the Buddha taught to Rahula. Bones are about as earthy as you can get in the body, solid, unmoving. And think if you can develop that as a touchstone for the kind of quality you want to find in your mind. And it's there. There is a still part of the mind. And there are still points in the body. Try to nurture those. And you have a sense of solidity there. So you're not blown around so easily by your, what happens around you, by other, your own moods. The potentials for skillful qualities, the potential for good things inside are there. And you want to nurture them. You want them to become as well. So if the Buddha were to appear in front of you, that was one of John Fuang's questions one day. If the Buddha were here right now and he asked you, days and nights fly past, fly past, what are you becoming? How would you answer him? And how could you behave so that when you give the answer it's true and it's something you can be proud of? So keep that point in mind, that what you think you are is simply a product of becoming, which means you're not stuck there, and you can't use it as an excuse, saying, well, I can't practice because I'm stuck here, and this is just the way I am. You kind of move on. This is what you've become so far, and it's the result of actions, it's the result of mental fabrications and all the processes that we hear about all the time in the Buddhist analysis of what happens in the mind. So put some effort into delighting in developing good qualities. Make that your pleasure. Because what's the pleasure of just being stuck with the way you are? It's a lazy pleasure. You want to take pleasure in mastering a skill, pushing yourself in areas that are not necessarily easy. But they're rewarding. There's that saying that you don't have to have hope for success in order to put an effort in. Because the principle is, okay, you put the effort in, and if it doesn't come quickly, the results, if the results don't come quickly, they will come at some point. There is that hope. And just keep putting in as much good energy as you can, as much delight in abandoning and delight in developing. That's how you can give a noble answer to that question of what you're becoming as days and nights fly past. <laughs>